I said you might not not want to cover your face oh, no, so that no. people can see your face during the video. Hello. Okay. Hello and welcome. I'm Christine E. Schultz, your favorite Elvish author. Uh, this is Isaac, my lovely boyfriend, and we're welcoming you today to another episode of Chapter Reactions, where we read a chapter or two from books that we've, usually that we've never read before, unless it's something that I've written, in which case I can't help that I've read it before. Um, but in order to uh, introduce you guys to new books that maybe you've never discovered before, uh, to see if, you know, you can find something new that you're interested in reading, and to see if we can find something new that we're interested in reading. Um, yeah, so just kind of introducing you guys to new books, and today the book that we'll be introducing you guys to, as well as ourselves, is The Truth and Lies of Ella Black, which as you can see, I got a discount from uh, from Books A Million, which is, you know, always going to be superior to me in my mind to Barnes & Noble. No offense to you, Barnes & Noble lovers. Uh, but I just really love Books A Million. Uh, nobody cares if you're offended. Anyway, so... Uh, I know that we do a lot of young adult fantasy and fantasy in general since I'm an author of young adult fantasy myself, but we're, you know, I told you guys that we're going to mix it up here and there, and uh, this is still a young adult book, but I think it's going to be more of a thriller, but you know what? In order to find out, let's read the blurb and then let's get into a chapter. Blurb it up. The blurb says, who do you trust when you can't trust yourself? Ella Black has always had dark inclinations. She has successfully hidden her evil alter ego from her family and friends, but Bella is always there, eager to take control and force Ella to do bad things. When Ella's parents drag her out of school one afternoon and fly across the globe to Rio de Janeiro with no believable explanation, Bella longs to break free, and so does Ella, because for all that her parents claim to be doing what's best for her, Ella knows there is something going on that they're not divulging, and she's determined to find out what. Once in Rio, Ella learns a shocking truth about her family that gives way to a mission through the streets and beaches of Brazil in search of her authentic self. But the truth has many layers, and as Ella uncovers more and more about her own history, she struggles to come to terms with just where it is she came from. A fast-paced cross-continental journey of identity, family, darkness and light, and the ways in which we define ourselves. So, what do you think of that description so far? Very interesting. So it's very interesting. I'm kind of curious to see if this is going to be purely a thriller or if with her having this alter ego, if it's, you know, really is like a thriller, you know, multiple personality type of thing, or if there's going to be maybe even more of a supernatural element to it. I do like supernatural. There, that's a possibility. But yeah, let's just read chapter one and uh, see what we think about of this book. Chapter one. Ooh, and they're labeled, this one is 38 days until she dies. Oh. Whoa. <laughs> All right. Spoiler alert. That she's going to die? Apparently. Well, I don't think it's a spoiler if it's on chapter one, page one. It's telling you. Okay. Gonna we're going to read this. We're going to read now. You're going to let me read now. I'm just 38 mm -hmm. days. I am huddled on a bench, shivering, but I don't care about being a bit cold because I'm busy. I have a pencil and a sketch pad balanced on my knees. And I'm sitting in a park in front view that has the Houses of Parliament in it, leaning on Jack, who is reading a book. I'm totally focused on my drawing. I'm not actually drawing the view in front of me. I do have a few, few pages of Big Ben's in my sketchbook, but it's just not the thing that seems to be appearing on the page. Are you nearly done? says Jack. I mean, you have to take as long as it takes, but it's going to rain, and... He leans over and looks at my drawing. Oh, he says. Oh, right. A metaphorical interpretation of the view? Yep. Ella Black has made me shiver on a bench for an hour so that she could draw a picture of Ella Black. It's not Ella Black. Sorry to break this to you, sweetie, but I think it really is. I look at it. She looks like me, but she isn't me. She has the same newly dyed purple hair, the same pale face, but there's something in the eyes. I wish Jack could see that, though I don't know how I could possibly expect him to. I have never told him and I never will. I laugh a bit from nerves and he does too. How's your book, I say. Brilliant, actually. The apocalypse is well underway. Hey, you know, you're right. This doesn't look quite like you. It's like you with psychotic eyes, isn't it? It's like you thinking about something you really, really hate. I look at him. I steady my breathing. 
Yes, I say. Yes, actually, it really is. You're not thinking about me, are you? I look at Jack. Blonde, unexceptional looking, and one of my two best friends in the world. One of my only two friends in the world. I love his face. I love the way we know each other's secrets. Actually, I know his big secret, but he doesn't know all of mine. Of course I'm not thinking about you, you dick, I say, and a raindrop falls right into my drawing and blurs its face. I close the sketch pad, and Jack puts away his apocalyptic thriller, and we run to a big tree and stand underneath it. We look at the rain and the people putting up umbrellas and hoods and walking fast to unimaginable places. We wait for it to ease up enough for us to walk to Trafalgar Square and catch a train home to Kent. We ran away to London because it was half term. We spent the morning going to free galleries and looking at the art, and then we bought some books and went to sit in the park. I tried to draw the lovely view, but I ended up drawing myself with psychotic eyes instead. I know why I did though, and I'm glad I did. By the time we get to Charing Cross, rush hour has started. It's later than we realized, even though I was literally looking at one of the most famous clocks in the world for quite a lot of the afternoon. Massive mis miscalculation, says Jack. I know, right? We stand and look at the people on the concourse. It is much busier than it ought to be, not just with commuters, though mainly with them, but also with half-term pe people like Jack and me. People who have come to London to look at the sights and then forgotten that you need to get a train home either earlier or later than this. If we get the right train, it will take only 40 minutes, but it might be an uncomfortable ride. We live in a commuter town, and people are going home by the thousands. It infuriates me. It makes me particularly angry because we have to make our way through it if we want to get home. All of a sudden, I long to yell at them to get out of my way. The journey is horrible, and although I try hard to fight it off, by the time we are already halfway back, my head is ringing. I'm standing up, separated from Jack by two businessmen types who got on at London Bridge and are pretending they're still at work. One is pressing right up against me, reading some boring financial thing on his iPad. The other is hanging onto a pole as desperately as if he were a stripper and making a very important phone call about a shareholder's meeting. My head is ringing, I tell myself, because I'm standing and tired and fed up. I haven't got my phone for distraction because I lost it yesterday. I can't talk to Jack because he's too far away. I have to live in the moment, and everything is blurred around the edges because I am standing and tired and fed up. I muttered to myself to try to keep it together. No one cares. No one notices. By the time we're walking back to my house, though, I know things are going wrong. I should not have drawn that picture. My ears are ringing with a high-pitched sound even though we're out in the open air, hand in hand, looking normal. Sometimes grabbing Jack's hand can ground me, and he never minds me doing that. I try to make this feeling stop. I try to use Jack's energy to balance myself. The ringing gets louder. It gets louder and louder. And although I am walking toward my house, and though I look normal, I know that I'm not a normal girl, and that I have to get to the safe place. I have to get to my bedroom with the door closed. I have to be on my own now. I squeeze Jack's hand, and he squeezes back because he has no idea what is going on inside my head. The pavement is dark with recent rain, and the clouds are gathering again, but right now the sunset is making the sky look like a purple bruise, and everything looks like a pain. Please go, I say internally. Go now, you can come back later. She makes my vision go a bit blotchy on the edges, and that's her way of saying, not later, now. Actually, I say to Jack, I need to do some art homework. I'm trying to breathe evenly, to appear normal. He doesn't seem to have noticed anything different. I will not impose upon the artiste any longer, he says. He flings a hand dramatically across his brow. I need to paint. I live for my art. Is that you saying you want me to bugger off? Would you mind? I mean it in a nice way. Bella is pressing on the inside of my head. I have to get him to go. I do wonder whether he can tell something is off, particularly after this afternoon, but he doesn't ask because he knows I don't want him to. I wish I could tell him, but I can't. I can't because I'm not brave enough. The part of me the world sees is a bit of a pushover, easily bullied, easily ignored. That's the better version of me. I don't dare try to be belligerent, particularly at a time like this, because anything could happen. The girl in my drawing might come pouring out and poison all of this. That would be the end of everything. Is this, uh, is that how I am when I need to work? When I tell you to bugger off? Yep. Yep, okay. Maybe I don't have a evil alter ego living inside my head. You do. We've discussed my multiple personalities before. Yep. It's Thursday, Christine. This is Thursday, Christine. Thursday, Christine is wild, at least according to this guy, so. Wild. Not the word I would use. Go on. Jack knows I want him to go, but I can see in his eyes that he is sad. 
Okay, fine, you can come in for a minute, I say, feeling Bella listening carefully to every word I say. And then, well, then yes, you can bugger off. I've got like a whole painting to finish, and you know I'm not very sociable when that happens. Only Humphrey can come anywhere near. Jack laughs. You spoil that cat. Then it's raining again, so we run the last bit, hand in hand, up the hill to my house. We run past a woman with long tangled hair who's struggling to put up an umbrella, and a man pushing a bike with a toddler on the back. The toddler wishes us and shouts, I'm getting wet! I wave back with my free hand and feel Bella in the other, gripping Jack, trying to use her powers to electrocute him, wishing he would die because he is normal and happy and she doesn't think that's fair. Jack is not really normal and happy, but he is compared with Bella. I love him. Everyone thinks that he's my boyfriend, but he's not. He's better than that. We have a thing that works for both of us. I don't want a real boyfriend. I don't think I'll ever want a relationship. My school is a posh girl school. But a lot of the states formers live in a world in which they defer absolutely to boys. It's pathetic, and it makes me mad, but I haven't been brave enough to say anything, because that would draw more unwelcome attention. Actually, if I tried to argue with them, Bella would jump out and smash the nearest simpering handmaiden with the closest fire extinguisher, so it's probably best that I buy it back. Jack likes the best side of me, which is the only thing he sees. Hanging out with me has helped him in all sorts of ways, and for a while he raised my status so I was not a top-level target. But that didn't last long, and soon after, the girls at school started on me again. I don't really know why they do it, except that I've always known I don't fit in. I expect the girls who are mean to me don't feel they fit in either, and probably they're using me to make themselves feel better. I don't know. All I know is that I'm not widely liked, and that feels like shit. I've never told Jack about the things that happened to me at school. He would only get upset and mad, and nothing would change apart from him being a little less happy. And I want Jack to be happy. Only Lily, my other best friend, knows what happens, and Lily protects me from it as much as she can. When we burst in, Mom is standing in the hallway, pretending she just happens to be there, holding something in her hands and smiling in smug anticipation. I look at it. My phone, I say, and she grins and holds it out to me. Someone handed it in, she says. The police called, and I picked it up. It restores your faith, doesn't it? A few moments later. is just saying that because it's a cliche. She doesn't need her faith restored. She's not disillusioned or cynical about anything, though she does make sure to keep me as safe as she possibly can at all times, from dangers that don't actually exist. I take my phone from her and quickly check it. Everything's exactly as it was when I saw it yesterday morning, just before I lost it in town. I don't think Mom has looked through it. I hope she hasn't. Bella is inside my head, clearing her throat, demanding attention. I push her aside. Mom doesn't look as if she's had a shocking insight into my school life. She is happy to see us, Jack and me. She lives for us. She stands around in the hall waiting for me to come home because I am her life. It's weird. Obviously it's nice, but I do feel bad for her because her life must be boring. Sometimes I try to imagine my way into her head, and I just can't. I don't think she has a dark side at all. She would be so upset if she knew the truth about me. That's why I can never tell her. Right now, Bella is knocking on the inside of my skull, and I need to get away. As soon as we are through the door, Mom clicks all the locks shut behind us. No house is quite as secure as ours. For as long as I can remember, keeping me safe has pretty much been Mom's career. She's compelled to make sure I am always safe. Always, always safe, all the time. It's almost funny that she relaxes when I'm tucked away in my bedroom, considering the fact that it's actually the danger zone. Jack is grinning back at her. How are you, Mrs. Black? He says in his polite way. You're looking lovely. She loves that. Mom adores Jack. She wants us to get married and give her lots of grandchildren. Again, she has no idea that can never happen, which is sweet. I say nothing because Bella is in my head and I can't talk very well at the moment. Cookie, she says. I've just made some. Still warm from the oven. I'm not going to stop to have a cookie, but I'll, have, but I'll save some for Bella because she might like them later. Unless they're the spelt and sweet potato ones Mom made last week, too. In which case, no one will ever, ever want one. No thanks, I say. Yes, please, Jack says at the same time. He's hoping for the chocolate chip cookies. I know it. While he follows her into the kitchen, I walk straight ahead and go into the bathroom and close the door and lock it and lean against and try to breathe. I have to get rid of them both. I have to make Jack go home in the next few minutes. My head tightens. Black spots dance across my vision. He is sitting at the table, flirting with Mum. They both do that. I think Jack finds it funny. God only knows what Mum is up to. She grins at him and looks coquettish and reminisces about her youth. And he laughs in all the right places and says the right things back to her. Neither of them particularly cares whether I'm bothered when they do this, and although it's gross, I just roll my eyes and look away. 
I hear mom say the cookies are ginger and sultana. That's just about acceptable, so I do my best to clear my head. I unlock the bathroom door and try to act normal, taking three cookies and wrapping them in a paper towel. Sorry, Jack, I say, and under mom's approving eye, I walk over and kiss the top of his head. Gotta do some painting. See you tomorrow. He laughs. Sure, see you tomorrow, else. I won't hang around. You're welcome to, mom starts to say, but I silence her with a glare and leave the room, gasping for breath, taking the stairs two at a time. I close my bedroom door and try to breathe. My head is ringing so loudly, I wouldn't be able to hear anything else. Not even a fire alarm or a nuclear siren if it went off. Maybe one of those things is happening right now, but I don't care if it is. I roll my sleeves up and look at the tiny lines on the inside of my arms. I'm ashamed of them. I'm never going to let that happen again. They are so small that only I know they're there. Be nice, I say to Bella. Be nice, she replies, imitating me. Be nice, always be nice. Oh, please stop. Please stop. Please stop. Please stop. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Leave. I don't know what is me and what is her. I put my hands to the sides of my face and scream silently like, like the painting. All I want is to be normal. I draw in a shuddery breath and press the palms of my hands on the carpet, feeling the floor, being here in this moment, myself in my room. One thing I have learned over the years is how to pretend. And when this door is closed, I don't have to pretend anymore. It can all come out. I pull the pictures out from under my bed. They are meticulous explosions of horror. They are filled with death and maiming and nightmares. Bella drew them, and she likes to look at them. Perhaps I can assuage her with them. I call her Bella because she's the dark side of me. It's Ella, but not. It's bad Ella, Bella. I gave her a name a few years ago, and that made it a bit better, because before that I called it the monster. Anything is a tiny bit better when it has a name. Bella is better than the monster. I didn't know then that Bella means beautiful. My Bella isn't beautiful at all. She's the opposite, but she's still Bella. Bella is desperate to own the whole of me. As Ella, I am alert and battling all the time. Sometimes I have to let Bella out before everything explodes. That's when she draws these pictures. It's scary, but after that happens, I feel calm and peaceful and, I think, kind of happy. Everything is balanced for a while. I'll look at the drawings now. They are done in black ink. Huge sheets of tiny detail like Hieromius Bosch, with the modern bits in them. Children are de decapitated here. Body parts are everywhere. There is blood and murder. These pictures take us ages, and I hope no one ever finds them, but they're definitely the best art I've ever done. But the day is different. She doesn't want to look at them now. Later, she says. It's hard to breathe. The ringing grows louder. I push my hands down on the carpet and try harder. Humphrey is waiting, I see. Humphrey always turns up when Bella's here. I have a cookie, I say desperately, and I unfold the paper towel and let them all fall across the carpet. I grab one and shove it into my mouth. But Bella spits it out because she sees something much better than a cookie. Humphrey has carried a terrified bird into my bedroom, somehow getting it past Mum, who would have screamed and shooed him away if she'd seen it. The bird is tiny. It looks like a baby. I wonder if Humphrey pulled it out of his nest, whether his mother is missing it. The bird is flapping its little wings and trying to fly away, even though its body has been punctured by Humphrey's teeth. He does this often, my cat. He's very much on Team Bella rather than Team Ella. He knows. I crawl over to it. I can't even hear the ringing anymore. It's just a white noise that blocks out the mundane world. I feel all traces of Ella leaving and then I am fully Bella and Ella has gone. That's and good because she is pathetic. I can hardly breathe as I reach for the hammer that Ella keeps under the bed. It's a little hammer that looks ladylike and inoffensive. When mom found it, Ella said it was part of her sculpting kit for art and she totally believed her. But I know the truth, she keeps it there for me. I pick the tiny thing up by a feather and place it on top of a history essay which is on top of a textbook on the floor. I straighten it, stroking it with a finger. Ella would hate this. She loves animals, but I am not Ella. Hello, I whisper, and I am Bella, through and through. Humphrey gives me a look. He is excited. He is a bad cat, and he never pretends to be anything different. My breathing quickens as I stare at the little bird. I can't hear anything. I can't see anything but the bird, and I know what I'm going to do. I wouldn't have arranged the creature and gotten out the hammer if I didn't. I know what I'm going to do because it is what I live for. The world is dark around the edges like a spooky photo. Everything else has faded away. Bird, book, cat, hammer, Bella. I feel sick, but not in a normal way. Nothing about this is normal for anyone but me. 
I can see the bird trying to fly away, and I know it will never fly again. I am Bella, and I can do anything. I have the power of life and death. I pick up the hammer, wait for a moment with it raised just high enough, savoring every second, and smash it down on top of the creature. I feel it crunch. I watch it shatter. I stare at the remains. I love doing this. Thanks, I breathe to the cat, and he tilts his head toward me in a you're welcome sort of way, a we're in this together way. This is what it's all about. I love it when I get to take over. I want to be Bella forever. I want her to stop being Ella Black and let me stay here in her body. I could do anything. The white noise starts to fade. Bella does too. I try to hang on to her. I hate doing this, says Ella's pathetic voice. Go away, I tell her. I'm scared, she says. No, you're not. Ella? The voice slices through everything, and Bella shrinks further away. The ringing is back, but it's quieter. I am mostly Ella now, cross-legged beside my bed, on the other side of the room from the door. It takes me several seconds to force down these feelings, to know that I need to be Ella again and not Bella. And when I do, I push the hammer under the bed and jump to my feet. My legs wobble. My heart pounds so hard they must be able to hear it downstairs. Lily has opened my bedroom door and is standing in the doorway. I look around, gasping for breath, drawing in great lungfuls of air and trying to use them to force the ringing away. I am in my bedroom. The walls are pink and blue, with anime posters and my sketches of Rio de Janeiro. My clothes are on the floor, my books on the table. There is a photo collage of me and Lily and Jack, laughing, doing ironic duck face pouts, posing with our arms around one another. Everything looks normal. Everything looks normal. But I know nothing is normal. I don't know what Lily's seen. I don't know if she saw Bella lift the hammer and kill the bird. Bella is not here. She is not. Lily cannot see her. She cannot see this. She cannot. I push the darkness away, away, away. In my head I say the words that bring me back to myself. They work only after Bella has done her thing and is nearly gone. The universe, the universe, the universe, I say. The universe, the universe, the whole universe. The only thing that fully chases Bella away is that cosmic perspective. If I think of the entire universe and how tiny I am, everything feels manageable because nothing I do matters. Nothing at all matters. Ella doesn't matter, and neither does Bella. Unfortunately, this really only works when she's on her way out. It doesn't stop her from arriving. I discovered the universe thing by mistake. I was in the downstairs bathroom, about 11 years old, battling a demon I understood even less than I do now. I had my back against the locked door, and I was pulling the wallpaper off the wall because I couldn't control myself and I had to destroy something. As I did it, Bella started to fade, and I read a line in a poem that is still hanging up on our downstairs bathroom wall. Whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. No doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. The universe is unfolding. It made Bella leave me alone. Now, just the words of the universe work, I see them over and over again. The ringing is fainter still, and then it just about stops. The edges of the world are sharp again. Bella is gone. My lips move, but I don't think any sound comes out. I must be nice. Be nice. Be normal. I have to be normal. Smile. You must smile. Oh, hey, Lily, I say. My voice trembles, but the words are kind of right. Um, don't come in. My voice snaps in the last bit as she steps into the room. She stops. I wobble to my feet, and then sit on the bed because my legs give out. Bella has zapped me of my energy. Oh, Ella. Lily is lovely. She's confused by my snapping at her because I never do that. Are you okay? Your mom said I could come up. I just came by because you haven't got your phone, and I wanted to... I see her look at my bed. I see her notice my phone. Oh, you got it back? Yes, back. Um, be normal. Sorry, I say. I form the word carefully. I am Ella. The cat brought in a bird. It's really grim. It's made me sick. Sorry, really, don't come in. I had to put it out of his misery. I had to. It's so difficult to come back to myself. It's harder every time. One day, I won't make it. One day, I'll be stuck as Bella. I know she wants that. I would hate it. It could never happen. Oh, shit, says Lily. Lily could never understand. I would never tell her, because if I did, she might not be my friend anymore, and I need her. I need her. Her friendship pulls me back, often, and always without her knowing. Oh, Ella, you poor thing. I've got a tissue. Hang on. She is walking toward me. Humphrey crouches, then runs, sprigging past her legs and out of the room and down the stairs. 
I pull her down to sit next to me on the bed and take her face in my hands. I cannot let her look at what I did. Her springy hair in my fingers grounds me. I am with Lily now. Seriously, I say, my face right in front of hers. Don't look. I'll clean it up. Could you maybe run down and get a plastic bag for my mom? I am hiccuping. It's all too much. I've always managed Bella better than this. I've always kept Lily away from her. Lately, it has been getting worse. Sure. Shit, Ella, you poor, poor thing. She puts her arm around me, and for just a moment, I lean in and bury my face in her shoulder. Her hair is loose. It tickles my face. I cling on, and then force myself to let go. When she has gone downstairs, I put my head in my hands. This is awful. I can't keep it up. Lily actually walked into a room and found Bella in it. Next time it could be worse, and then everyone will know. I can't get my thoughts straight or shop, stop shaking, but I have to clean this up. I can't let Lily know, and I can't let Jack know either. They cannot know. No one can know. I leave the poor smashed bird where it is and fold the history essay around it. I am shaking, and a feather falls out of the package. I kick the textbook out of the way and try to pick up the stray feathers, though I really need a vacuum to get the carpet clean. Mom will be pleased to see me spontaneously using the vacuum cleaner. At least that will make her happy for a bit. When Lily comes back with the bag, I drop in the bird in, in its essay coffin and drop most of the feathers in too. I'll just wash my hands. Lily ties the handles of the bag and takes it downstairs while I lock myself in the bathroom and try to breathe without it catching, without gasping or taking such shallow breaths that I feel dizzy. I wash my hands with lots of soap. I splash my face with cold water and soap and take off my old makeup. I put on some moisturizer to make my skin soft and smooth. I breathe in and out. In, out, in, deeply, out, deeply. I close my eyes. I remember smashing the bird. It made Bella happy. And Bella is part of me. I do not want to make I do not want that to make me happy. I do not want to be part Bella. I do not want it to build up inside me like this. I do not want to be someone who smashes birds with a hammer. I do not want to be this girl. I do not want to be bad. And that is the end of the fascinating first chapter in The Truth and Lies of Ella Black. Thoughts? Comments? The poor bird. The poor bird, yes, the poor bird. Any other thoughts and comments? I like the way it shifted between Ellen and Bella in that one part. Yeah, I definitely like how seamlessly seamlessly we flowed from Ella's head into Bella's yeah. head, which I read pretty well and I you didn't did. mean to because I didn't know what was happening. Great job. Um, but yeah, I really like that and I hope that we see more of that. And yes, yeah, so I'm really interested to find out what's going on with the Ella, Bella personalities again is it just something where she has multiple personalities inside of her is it something psychological or is there gonna be some kind of su kind of supernatural element which i feel like there could be um why does you know the whole universe thing keep bella away again yeah, is that a psychological thing or does it have something to do with like a more supernatural element that we're going to learn on down the line these are all questions that we can all answer for ourselves by reading the truth and lies of ella black by i should have checked this already by emily Barr. I'm sure that you can find this book for yourself uh, at your local Barnes & Noble or Books A Million. Um, and I'll also leave some links down below where you can find the book. On that note, happy reading, and I will see you all in my next video. Now read the rest of it.